that if it were possible, the hour might pass away from him. You see? So he's calling out for help. He's praying for help. Allah says in the Quran that he's the one who answers those who need the call for help. And I'll end it. Thank you. Shadid brought up uh, many good points. Those of you that are familiar with the Christian concept of God, Christians believe that there is one God, but yet this one God manifests himself. There's three distinct personalities, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So the very nature of God is also a question we could debate. And so when we hear in Rashid's, I'm sorry, uh, Shadid's um, presentation, we read and we hear all this time that the people had these comments. He's man. He is calling out to the Father. And it would be impossible, as I said in the short time here, to give full explanation, but we understand that the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Bible says He humbled Himself and He took on the very nature of man. And everything that he did was in subjection to the direction of his heavenly Father. And so when Jesus came and he says, the Father is greater than I, did not mean that he was greater in essence, because Jesus himself, as I'll show further, was God. But it was a positional standing. So in the Christian faith, we have the Father, we have the Son, and we have the Holy Spirit. All three are God, all three are co-equal, but when it comes to a positional or a hierarchy, we see the Father. And so when he mentions that... You know, he prayed to the Father. Yes, he was praying to his Father. Why? Because he limited himself. He was under the direction of his Heavenly Father. He did nothing, he says. I do nothing unless the Father tells me what to do. And so even though he's in the very nature God, he humbled himself, the Bible says, and became obedient like a slave to Heavenly Father. Why did he do that? To show us who are mere mortals how to live, how to walk in obedience to God's will. The first objection that was brought up by Shadid was that he was just a prophet. And the crowds cried out, he was a prophet, a great prophet has risen among us. But when did the crowd ever become the authority? The crowds have a lot of ideas. In fact, the very scripture that I opened up this afternoon's debate with was, Jesus came to his disciples and said, who do men say that I am? And they said, well, John the Baptist, Elijah. Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. You see, the understanding, the common understanding was that he was a prophet. And Jesus was a prophet. He fulfilled the role of a prophet. But he also fulfilled the role of a judge. He fulfilled the role of a shepherd. He fulfilled the role of an overseer. These were all titles. But the part that I did not read, and I cut off in Matthew chapter 16, he says to his disciples, he says, but who do you say that I am? Because the crowd did not give the correct answer. The apostle Peter stepped forward and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Now those terms may be debatable and I'm going to try to answer those in a minute. And Jesus replied and he said, blessed are you Simon for man has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly Father. You see, you couldn't even have the understanding of who Christ was unless the Father himself granted you that understanding. And so Peter makes this profession. And Jesus goes on to say, this very profession that you made, Peter, will be the very foundation that I am God, that I will build my church upon. And so we see it didn't matter what the crowds had to say. The crowds, he came along and they recognized. They knew. They knew a great prophet was going to arise. They knew the scriptures. They knew the Messiah was going to come. The problem was they didn't know who it was going to be. So many times men would rise up and they would proclaim themselves to be the Messiah. And if you know the scriptures, we see the Pharisees constantly following Jesus around, asking him question after question after question. Are you the Messiah? In fact, they came to John the Baptist, who was Jesus' cousin, and he said, are you the Messiah? And he said, no. He said, I'm not even worthy to untie the sandals of the one who's coming after me. And that was his cousin, Christ. And so we see Christ in this dual nature. He took on human flesh. He limited himself. We see that he gets tired. 
He was thirsty. He wept. But on the other hand, we see that He performs these great miracles. And so, as Christianity teaches that this is the second person of the Godhead, Christianity definitely teaches there's one but one God. That's the great Shema of the Old Testament. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one. And so when we get to the New Testament, for a Jew to believe that there could be other gods, it was impossible. They had been brought up, just like young Muslims, that there's one God. We have that drilled into our head as Christians. There is one God. There is one God. But yet, the nature of God. And we can't understand it, but it's revealed to us in the Scripture that there's a triune nature, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And as we read through the Scriptures, we see each one being referred to as God. And... Shadid made the comment that Jesus had the opportunity to clearly say that he was God. Well, he did. In John chapter 10, verse 36, he says this. I and the Father are one. And it says again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. They knew what he said. There was no doubt in their mind. They had been raised in the synagogue. They knew the, the Shema. They knew the entire law of God. They knew there was no God but one God. And Jesus comes along and He says, I and the Father are one. And this floored them. They couldn't understand. They were, they were appalled that a man would say this. And listen to what else they say. Again, the Jewish opponents had picked up stones to stone Him, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We're not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy. Because you, a mere man, claim to be God. And Jesus answered him, It's not written in your law, I have said that you are gods. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father has set apart as his only very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Do not believe me unless I do what my father does. The statement that he made was incredible to the Jewish mind. When he said, I and the father are one. But that's not the only time he claimed to be God. There's numerous other examples. He made it very clear to the audience that he was God. He was brought... Hands tied, whipped, beaten. And they brought him before we call the Jewish high priest. He was the head over the entire nation. Every matter that had to deal with religion was brought to the Jewish high priest. And he would consult the scriptures. And so the Jews of that day, they, they followed him around. They knew exactly what he was saying. They weren't too happy with it. And so they arrested him and they bring him to the Jewish high priest. And the high priest says to this to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. In other words, I charge you to tell the truth. you got to tell me the truth. You know, we go into court now, and you raise your right hand, I swear to tell the truth, hold the truth, nothing but the truth, so help me God, and you take your, your oath. And whether it's in Islam or whether it's in Christianity, oaths are sacred. You make that oath unto the living God. And so the high priest says, I charge you under oath of the living God, of the Father. Tell us. <laughs> If you are the Messiah, the Son of God. You have said so, Jesus replied. In other words, he answers in the affirmative. Though he doesn't say yes, he says, yes, you have said so. Now listen to what he says. And Jesus replied, but I say to all of you from now on, you will see the Son of Man, which was another term indicating deity, sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on clouds of heaven. Jesus, before the high priest, tells him, Yes, it is as you said, I am the Messiah. I am the Son of God. Those terms are synonymous. Then he uses another term, I am the Son of Man. And when he says this to the high priest, the high priest rips his robe. And he says this, He has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look now, you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. This wasn't the crowd shouting this. The, these were the men trained in the Scriptures. And Jesus in His answer, most people don't really know this, but He quotes from Daniel chapter 7 in the Old Testament. 
And this is why that high priest tore his robes, because there was no doubt in his mind what Jesus was claiming. He was claiming that He was God. Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 through 14 says this, In my vision I looked at night, and there before me was one like a son of man. Here's that term. Coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days, or the Father, and was led into His presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worship Him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. He quoted Daniel chapter 7 that the high priest knew like we would know the Bible, some of you would know verses from the Quran. And when he heard that, he ripped his clothes. And he accused Christ of blasphemy. They knew what he was saying. Jesus himself knew what he was saying. And what did they do to him? Did they believe what he said? No. They took him. They scourged him. They beat him. Many of you have seen the various movies. They nailed him to a cross. But that was all in the Father's perfect will. That was the plan. Little did they realize it. That God would send His only begotten Son. That who would ever believe in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And by simple faith in the Son of Christ dying on that cross for our sins, we have eternal life. There's no doubt that Christ claimed to be deity. And He so taught it and so convinced those that were reared in a religious culture that would have rejected anything. They understood. He was not the Father. He even admits it. He says the Father is greater than I. He, he differentiates himself. And all through the Old Testament we see that. But in some form, some way, some capacity, we find out that He is deity. And the Scriptures reveal that He's the second person of the Godhead, the Son of God. Thank you. All right, so let us begin. Um, we, we had heard, uh, it was mentioned that, uh, that God never changes. That God never changes. And that is correct. However, again, when we look at Jesus, we see that he did change. For example, in Luke chapter 2, verse 52, it says that Jesus increased in wisdom and in favor with God. Again, notice how... God is different, and Jesus is, is, is someone other than God. Luke 2.52, Jesus increased in wisdom. So this is, that means he's changing, just like all of us. We, we, as we grow, as we learn knowledge, we increase in knowledge. We increase in wisdom through life experiences. 
So here Jesus is changing because he's increasing in, in knowledge and wisdom. In Islam we have a, a term, God is Al-Hakim. He is the wise. He is the wise, meaning he knows all wisdom. You see, he doesn't increase in wisdom as life goes along. He already has all the wisdom that, that, that there is to have. Whereas we have to grow and learn and increase. So in Islam, that is one of the titles, that is one of those 99 names, Al-Hakim, the wise. The definite title, the wise. You see, we can be wise, but nobody can say, you are the wise. No, you will increase in wisdom as your life goes on. But God is the wise with the definite title there. You see, because why? Because he has the wisdom. He doesn't have to grow and learn. Whereas Jesus had to increase in it. And notice, as he increased, his favor with God also increased. Again, I ask you to think. If he is supposed to be God himself, who is he increasing in favor with? Why does it say he increased in favor with God if he himself is supposed to be God standing right there? Who is he increasing in favor with? Is there another God? The Christians say, no, you Muslims got it wrong. We only believe in one God. Then tell me, who is he increasing in favor with? Why does it say he increased in favor with God? If there's only one God, and Jesus is supposed to be that with the, the other persons, who are distinct, meaning they're different, but it somehow still is one God, then who is this other God that he's increasing in favor with? If, if Jesus then is with the Trinity, and he's increasing in favor with God, and obviously, again, I'm trying to make sense of it, that he's supposed to be the God along with, or in the Godhead with the Trinity, but yet he's increasing in favor with God, then is there another God? So either there's another God, or Jesus must not be God, and he's increasing in favor with the true God. The other thing was mentioned uh, that Jesus, he humbled himself. The other explanation was that, okay, yes, those things were done, those things were said, but that was because he had humbled himself. Now again, this is somebody else saying, remember what I said, that we both gave arguments of what other people said, but I said that the, the strength of what the other people said can only be strengthened if the person whom is being referred to confirms what the people say. So they're either going to confirm one line of rumors or statements or the other. Whoever, whichever statements are confirmed by the person himself, then those people's statements are stronger than the others. As I showed, the statements that I gave of other people were consistent with what was said that Jesus himself said. He said he was a man. He said he heard the truth from God. That, that's consistent with the crowd that said he was a prophet. That took him for a prophet. Right? They took him for a prophet. Jesus says, yeah, I'm a man who heard the truth from God. <clears throat> That's pretty much the definition of a prophet. Oh, you know, also he prophesizes things. Jesus did that too, according to the scriptures, right? So therefore, that Jesus' statement confirms those who said he was a prophet. He says, I am a man, and I heard the truth from God. Again, that's John 8.40. So what about this here, where Paul in Philippians says that Jesus, he was in the form of God, but he humbled himself. Well, let's get, let's get, does Jesus confirm that or does Jesus say something opposite? Let's take a look. If you turn to John 8, 42, Jesus says the opposite of what Paul says. John, Jesus, according to John says in 8, John 8, 42, he says, If God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Does that sound like somebody who, yeah, I got the power, I'm going to lower myself on my own and... I'm going to go forward and do this. I did it myself. No, he says, I did not come on my own, but he sent me. <clears throat> Someone obviously has more power than Jesus. So it's not a matter of, you know, a, a, voluntar a, a voluntarily humbling yourself and saying, you know what, I got this. I, I'm the ruler, but I'm going to go ahead and just take a position, a lesser position for right now. No, he says, I didn't come on my own. He sent me. He sent me. So, obviously, this humble, someone else is making the statement that he was God and he humbled himself. But Jesus says, no, I didn't. I didn't come on my own. The statement uh, when Peter was asked, who do men say that I am? Notice, what did Peter say? He said, you are the Christ. We already went over that. What is the definition of Christ? Christ means the anointed one. And in this understanding, it, it means one who is anointed of God, not someone who is God himself, but someone who is anointed of God. Peter didn't say, you are your God. He said, you are the Christ. And no, and what after that? Even though he said, son of, still, if I'm the son of the president, am I the president? Will you, if, if, you go to, if you meet Barack Obama's daughters, right, Malia, I don't know if I got the other one's name, if you meet them, and they like, oh look, this, you're the daughter of the president. 
Nobody's going to understand. Hey, you, you just called her the president. No, you say, that's the daughter. So if you're supposed to be the son of God or the son of the king or the son of the ruler, how is this being transferred that means that you are actually the ruler himself? Or that you're God himself? You're the son of God, then you're not God. You're God's son, supposedly, right? But what does this term son of God mean? It's used throughout the Bible. There are other people who are called son of God in the Bible. Did you know that? In the Old Testament, other people are called son of God. It's, not, it's a common term. What does this mean? According to Romans chapter 8, verse 14, it says, All those, Jesus included, all those who are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. All those. All those who are led by the Spirit of God, you're all the sons of God. So what, that's what the term means. It means if you're being led, if you're a righteous person, if you're led by the Spirit of God, you are the son of God. Not, not, it doesn't mean that you're God. You see? <clears throat> the Shema was mentioned. Interesting, the Shema, it was said that it, the, uh, the response was going back to the Shema, which is the, the Jewish statement of faith. Here are Israel, the Lord our God is one. If you look historically, the ancient Israelites understood this terminology to, to mean that God was indeed one. They never, the Jews never believed in the Trinity. As Christians, check it out. Do the research. Go back historically and look. Did the ancient Israelites, did they have a, a concept that, as the Christian have of God? Did the, did the ancient Israelites ever have a belief in the Trinity as the Christians did? You will find it's not there. The ancient Israelites did not have a belief. They're, they did not understand the Shema, Herod is the Lord our God is one, to mean that God was more than one person. They didn't, they didn't have that kind of concept. You see? It was made mention that in John chapter 10, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. So therefore, he was supposedly saying he was God. Right? That was the argument. I and the Father are one, he's admitting he's God. Then you have more than one God then, everyone, because in John chapter, um, what's that, John chapter 20, Jesus speaking of the disciples, look what he says here, excuse me, John chapter 17. In John chapter 17, verse 21 and 22, what does Jesus say about the disciples? And remember now, the argument, he said, I am, I am God or one, this was a clear admission that he's God, okay? John chapter 20, 17, verse 21 and 22. This is supposed to be Jesus speaking. He says that they all may be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they may also be one in us, that the world may believe that you have sent me. And the glory which you have given me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we are one. So this is supposed to be, what's that? Uh, I, I believe Judas was still here at the time. So this is 12 people, plus the three. This was 15 now, right? Are they all gods? He said they're one. He said we're all one. Does that mean when, when somebody says you're one with God, does that mean you're one? You see, he's using the same terminology he used when he said I and the Father are one. Now he's saying you, the disciples, you're all one too. We're all one in God. The son of man term. My studies have shown me that when in actuality the son of man does not mean a deity does not mean deity. It actually means exactly what it says. Son of man, meaning this is another way of saying you are a human being. You're a regular person. And the Bible bears witness to this. If you look at the book of Job, Job chapter 25, verses 4 through 6 says this, and it's very interesting. Look, listen to what it says carefully. It says, How then can man be justified with God? Good question. How can, we, how can we equal up man to God? It says, how can man be justified with God? Or how can he be clean that is born of a woman? We were all born of a woman, including Jesus. Jesus was born of a woman. So how can he be clean? In other words, how can he be truly pure and clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even to the moon, and it shines not. Yes, the stars are not even uh, pure in his sight. How much less man that is a worm, and the son of man, which is a worm. So this clearly shows that the son of man term is not understood in reference to deity. It is, is understood to be referring to human beings. You're referring to a regular person, a regular man. You're the son of man. So here, this makes a good comparison about God, thank you, about uh, God and man. That man can't be justified with God. The son of man is a worm compared. In God's sight, the, the son of man, man, you're like a worm compared to God. Okay? So it is clear then that the evidence is strengthened here. That those who said he was a prophet is reaffirmed by Jesus, words that are attributed to Jesus. He said he was a man. He said he heard the truth from God. He said he does the will of the one who sent him. He says he didn't come on his own. Someone sent him. You know, all these terms show that these, th these are the words of a man who doesn't himself believe he's God. Again, he cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? 
he clearly, obviously, it, it appears that he believes that God is someone other than himself. God is someone other than himself, and he cries out to that God. So declare that Jesus, the answer, Jesus, prophet or God, he's a prophet of God. Thank you. Batteries up here. I didn't know if you pulled them out on me. You know. <laughs> Good trick. I like that. <laughs> Something I would do. Okay, we heard uh, in the rebuttal, you know, some things. And once again, it, it, what he had to say basically proves my point because we see that Christ humbled himself, took on the form of a servant. Even though he was in very nature God, it tells us in the New Testament, he humbled himself and became obedient to death. So when we read these, these scriptures that sound like he's saying that, uh, you know, he's just a man. There were references. There, we, don't, we don't deny that. But on the other hand, we also say that he was the Son of God, and we set forth the scriptures that tried to prove that. He had mentioned, uh, Shadid had mentioned that God never changes, and that's exactly right. God in his glorified state never changes. He's unchangeable. That's what he, one of his titles but Christ in the form of man, we see that he what? He grew up. He mentioned the scripture that he, gained, he, he grew in wisdom. He grew in understanding or favor with men and with God. Okay? And so there was a process that he allowed himself to go through until the day he was revealed. We never deny that. Christians never denied it. But he was God in the flesh. You know, Peter told Jesus... After the resurrection of Christ, we read of a conversation between Peter and Jesus. And Peter, as I mentioned earlier, had denied Christ three times before he went to the cross. Jesus himself predicted that in a prophetic role. And we do not deny that he was a prophet, but he was something even greater than that. But after his resurrection, he confronts Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, I love you. He asked him a second time, do you love me, Peter? Peter said, Lord, I love you. He asked him a third time, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. What really was being transmitted there was that Jesus was giving Peter an, a, an opportunity to proclaim how much he loved him. You see, prior to the death of Christ, Peter proclaimed to Jesus himself that he would go to his death protecting Jesus. And he, in essence, was saying, I love you so much, I'm going to give you 100%. I'm willing to die. But we know that he didn't do that. He ran away with all the other disciples of Christ when they came and they, they arrested him. And so in the Greek... Not the English, but in the Greek it says this. Peter, do you love me 100%? And Peter says, Lord, I love you 30%. And he asked him a second time, do you love me 100%, Peter? He said, Lord, I love you 30%. There's a difference in the Greek words, filio and agape. And finally, the third time, Jesus says, Peter, do you love me 30%? He says, yes, Lord, you know all things. You know I only love you 30%. I was, I'm not willing to lay down my life for you. He brought him to a place where Peter acknowledges, Lord, you know all things. You know my heart. I shot my mouth off before. And the scripture constantly tells us that Jesus didn't need no man to tell him because he knew the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Who else but God himself could know those things? Shadid made mention that these terms... And there's really four in the New Testament. Messiah, Son of God, Son of Man, 
and Lord are terms that are commonly used throughout the Scripture, and they are. When he gave reference from the book of Job about the Son of Man, these were terms that were common terms. However, when applicable to Christ in the New Testament, they take on a whole new realm of meaning. In fact, when, when Peter answered, he said, you are the Christ, you are the Messiah, you are the Anointed One, the Son of God. As I said earlier, those terms are synonymous. And Peter had an understanding that he was claiming to be deity. Before the high priest, the high priest said, you, we, had, we, we command you in the name of God Almighty to tell us, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah, the Son of God? And those terms meant a whole lot different than just saying a man. Because when he affirmed it, that high priest accused him of blasphemy. And he was, these high priests and the priesthood were not ignorant of what the scriptures had to say. And so all throughout the time we see that these terms become applicable to Jesus. And I'm going to read just a couple of them real quick. The anointed, and he, he was correct, he, to be set apart, the Messiah. <laughs> but even in the Old Testament, John 20, 31 says this, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Romans 9.5 says this, Theirs are the patriarchs, speak, speaking of the Jews, and from them is traced the human ancestry of the Messiah, listen, who is God over all, forever praised. Amen. How about the term Son of God? I said, I and the Father are one. I said, when the Jews heard that, they definitely understood what He was claiming. He was claiming to be a one. In fact, he even used the scripture to prove it. He was not just saying that I'm not God. He was just saying, right now I'm in a submissive pers uh, position to my Father. I've come to do my Father's will. Not my own will, but my Heavenly Father's will. Why? To serve an example to humankind is how they should serve the one true God. Mark 5, 7 says he shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want from me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? You know who said that? It was a demon. Jesus came and he exhibited the very power of God. He was casting out demons out of people that were demon-possessed. And the demons recognized him and they shuddered and they said, Don't torture us before the time. They recognized his deity. Does that prove that he was no, that because a demon yells it? No. But it's further proof. They understood who he was. And they had to obey the command of Jesus himself. 1 John 5.13 says, These things I have written to you so that you will know that you have eternal life. And you believe in the name of the Son of God. And that's from the Aramaic version. So the Bible uses the term Son of God also in a very general term throughout the Scriptures, the Old Testament, and even sometimes in the New. But when speaking about Christ, Jesus Himself, it always, always takes on, it connotes deity every single time. How about the Son of Man? I use that already. He said in his studies, well, you should have studied Daniel chapter 7 because Daniel chapter 7 sets out the definition. The way you interpret the Bible is by the Bible, not by some uh, uh, Bible theologian. There are, there are various rules of biblical interpretation. I don't know about the Quran, but in the Bible, you better know the historical context. You better know the context of the people that it was written to. You better know the grammar. You better know who the audience it was written to. You better know the terminology. And so we're not familiar with a lot of that because we live in a whole, we live 2,000 years from that. So things they said, things they did are, are kind of awkward to us. But when we understand these various rules of interpretation, and so when it's used, that term Son of Man in Daniel chapter 7, it clearly denotes deity, and that high priest understood it. And Jesus could have backed off and said, wait, you know what, you misunderstood me. Don't, don't crucify me. And if you know anything about crucifixion, it was a horrible way to die. But yet Jesus, whether you believe he believed it or not, that's what he proclaimed. That's why he died. And that was the message that the early Christians and Christ, true Christianity today continues to preach. That Jesus is the second person. That he died for the sins of the world. And then finally the term Lord. Another general term. And speaking to a master or to an important official, they would use the term Lord. But when they came to Christ, it took on a whole different connotation. 1 Timothy 6.13 says, In the sight of God who gives life to everything, and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate, made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who? Our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in His own time. God, the blessed and the only ruler, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who's he speaking about? He's speaking about Jesus Christ. 
Philippians 2, 5 through 11 says this, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by being becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess, whether on the earth, under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So these terms that were brought out, yes, they were used in a very general way throughout the Scripture. Nobody denies that. But when it comes to the very person of Jesus Christ, these terms take on a whole different meaning. His disciples understood it. His enemies understood it. And as I said, he was put to death because of it. One minute. Thank you. Uh, I got one minute yet, so I'm going to read one thing here. I know you want me to leave. Uh, I'm going to be quick, all right? Probably my wife. Get him off there. He just talks too much. I want to read Hebrews chapter 1. In the past, God spoke through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, and through whom also He made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. And after he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So he became as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angel spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the sun, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. And he also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment, and you will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. Who he's speaking about? He's speaking about Jesus Christ. He refers to him even in the Psalms, even in the New Testament. God, your God, has exalted you above every name that could be named. And at your name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Thank you very much. All right, uh, again, it was mentioned uh, that the humbling, that Jesus had humbled himself. So this is a way to explain all these things of Jesus crying out and praying. Again, I had mentioned that that's a, there's a contradiction here. When you go, Paul is the one who says that Jesus humbled himself. But I gave you words that were attributed to Jesus where he says he did not humble himself. He says he didn't even come on his own. See, this idea of humbling yourself gives the impression that Jesus voluntarily like he said, yeah, I'm God, but I myself, I'm going to go ahead and accept this lower position for now. So it was voluntarily. Jesus, I gave you John 8:42. He says, I did not come of myself. That shows that he was sent without his, without, you know, it wasn't a voluntary thing. In other words, you have a commander. Your commander says, I need you to go and do this right now. You got to submit to your commander. 
You don't have the authority. You, you got your commander say, go do it, you do it. That's the difference between, humbling is, hey, nobody told me what to do, I have the power, you know, like let's say Bill Gates. Bill Gates says, you know what, today I'm gonna lower myself and I'm gonna work on the floor with the guys who put the parts together. Right, I'm normally, I'm just, I'm, I own the company. I'm the one who makes the money, I pay you guys. Today I'm gonna lower myself and I'm gonna go work on the floor with the regular guys who make the, the regular wage. I'm gonna work with them today, I'm gonna lower myself. I'm not even gonna be the boss. I'm not, you're not, no, no, I'm not gonna tell anybody what to do, I'm just gonna lower myself. It's voluntarily though, right? Jesus is saying, no, what happened to him was not voluntary. He did not come on his own. Hey, if you want another verse, if that wasn't enough, if 842 wasn't enough, let's look at John 7, 28. Again, he says the same thing. John says that Jesus said, you both know me and you know whence I am. And I am not come of myself, but he that sent me is true, whom you know not. Again, notice he's telling you he was sent. He did not come on his own. So there's no humbling. He wasn't God. He, didn't, was, he, he, he wasn't God and then lowered himself. No, he's saying, I didn't come on my own. He sent me. God sent me. The one greater than me sent me. All right? He mentioned that, uh, again, God in the flesh. So I'm saying, okay, I'll accept this from you if you could explain, if he's God in the flesh, why does he cry out to God? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If he's God in the flesh, that means God is right there. He's, he's God in the flesh, right there. So why are you crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I'm, I'm God in flesh, so who am I talking to, right? Who is he talking to if he's God in the flesh? Why is he crying out saying, my God, my God, why have you, you, someone else, forsaken me? You have left me. You've abandoned me. I'm God in the flesh, so I can't be left because I'm myself. That's like me saying, you know, Shadid just left himself at the podium. I'm still here. Right? I say, hey, Shadid, Shadid, why are you leaving me? Like, you guys be like, you're, you're right there. You're you. I'm me in the flesh. So how, why would I cry out to myself if I am myself right here? Does, does that make sense? <laughs> it was mentioned that Jesus knew things. That, you know, uh, the response was, you know, um, only God knows these things or something of that sort in reference with the conversation with Peter. But Jesus tells you that his information, he didn't, he didn't get it on his own. Look, let's take a look. John chapter 12, verse 49. The writer of John says that Jesus says in John 12, 49, I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment what I should say and what I should speak. Imagine now, this is God in the flesh. So why is God in the flesh being given a commandment? Who's commanding, imagine, who is commanding God what to say? Right? All of us, we believe that God is the supreme being, the most high. Right? We use these terms in both Christianity and Islam. The Most High, the Almighty. Here he says, he was given a commandment. Imagine that. God Almighty being commanded what to say. Who? What, what other, unless there's a greater God. Is there a greater God that's telling a lesser God what to say and what to do? Jesus said, he gave me a commandment. Those are the words right here. A commandment. What I should speak and what I should say. So that incident with Peter... He still he tells you, look, yeah, God told me what to say and what to do. So therefore, it's, it's, it doesn't mean he's God. Uh, the demons. You remember, again, no, notice the words that are being used. Notice the demons didn't say, you know, don't, don't do us any harm. God. No, they said son of. The term son of God. Not, not God yourself. All these terms is always son of the living. Son of. Son of. All right? Even the incident, let's go back to John 10, 30. Even the incident in John chapter 10, verse 30, right? Where, uh, I'm excuse, that John 10, 30, I believe it is, where he has the, uh, the, yeah, the altercation and they, you know, they, they charge him with blasphemy, right? And um, notice though, Jesus argues back. He doesn't accept their charge. He doesn't say, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you're right. I, I said, I'm God. I committed blasphemy, but I, but I am God. No, he argues with them. He says, is it not written in your law? I said, you are gods? So he's telling them, look, why are you, you know, wait, hold on a second, guys, slow down. What are you getting upset for? Doesn't the scripture also call you gods, who, who, who the scripture came to? So why are you getting upset with me? And notice, he doesn't say that he said he was God. He says, so wait, if the scripture says, those to whom the scripture came, that you are gods, why are you getting upset with me? I'm only saying that I'm the son of God. 
That's what he says in the rest of the verse, in verse 36. He says, Say ye of him whom the Father has sanctified and sent into the world, you blaspheme, because I said I am the Son of God. He didn't say, well, I said I'm God too. No. He argues with them first and says, hold on, why are you getting upset? Have you forgotten that the previous scriptures, it called people gods also? It said, you are gods. And I'm not even saying I'm God. I'm saying I'm the son of God. Again, the, 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 uh, the, the example I gave of the president's daughters. The daughters of the president, you would never think they're the daughters. If Barack Obama had a son, you, would, you wouldn't think, if he said, hey, I'm the son of the president, you wouldn't understand that to be saying that he's the president. So why does the son of God all of a sudden mean you're God yourself? And I use, I, I gave the, I use the, the example that the pastor gave. Use the scripture to interpret the scripture. Romans 8.14 says, all those who are led by the spirit of God, that's the son of God. That's what it means. And the example of the son of man, I did that as well. I didn't, I didn't refer to a theologian. I referred to the book itself. I used the book of Job, chapter 25, verse 4 through 6, which was making a comparison between God and man, saying that the son of man is a worm. So clearly then the Son of Man is not understood, at least in the, in the ultimate. That's the difference also is that my reference is in the Old Testament. So the term Son of Man is closer being used in that same time period, right? Because both of the terms, the examples are from the Old Testament. Whereas the example that was given by the pastor is in the New Testament, which is a different time period and a different language. So the example I gave is closer to the, to the time period that it was originally used, Son of Man in the book of Job, the Old Testament. So here it says that the Son of Man is understood to be a regular human being who in the sight of God is a worm compared to God. A reference was made to Timothy, right? That Timothy made these very uh, um, praiseworthy statements about Jesus. But did the writer of Timothy think that Jesus was God? Let's take a look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. In 1 Timothy 2, verse 5, it appears that the writer of Timothy does not take this idea that Jesus is God. In 1 Timothy 2 verse 5, it says, For us there is but one God and one mediator, the man Christ Jesus. Not the God Christ Jesus, the man Christ Jesus. This is Timothy. So this, this shows me that the writer of Timothy in this part doesn't seem to be saying that Jesus is God. Notice the words. For us there is but one God, right? One God, one mediator between... God and man. So I got one here, one here, and one here. Right? That man in the middle, he's also a man. He's over here. He's with these people. So God is here. The mediator here. Mankind is here. And the mediator, he's also a man with the rest of mankind. And he's the mediator. You see? One God and one mediator. One of each. One God, one mediator. The mediator is obviously the person who will mediate on your behalf between two parties. So here it says that Jesus is the mediator. He's not God himself. He is the mediator between God and man. How can he be God himself is he, if he's between God and man? You see? And it says the man, Christ Jesus. You see? So here it appears that this, the writer of Timothy, at least in 1 Timothy, takes it that Jesus is the mediator between God and man, but not God himself. There's only one God, it says, and one mediator. It's one of each. And the mediator is not God. God is not the mediator. And lastly, he mentioned uh, the reference to sitting on at the right hand. Well, if he's God, why, why isn't he sitting on, on the position itself? Why is he sitting or standing at the right hand of God? Oh, no, my right hand's I'm sorry. <laughs> right? Why is he on the right hand of God? One minute, right? Why is he sitting on the right hand if he's God himself? Shouldn't he be right in the center position as opposed to on the right hand of? You see? And this is seen in uh, the book of Acts chapter 7, verse 55. In Acts chapter 7, verse 55, this is a vision of a man named Stephen. And Stephen is supposed to, I guess he, he gets the, the Holy Ghost comes over him, and he sees the vision of Jesus in, excuse me, in his heavenly state. Look what it says, Acts chapter 7, verse 55 and 56. It says, but he, referring to Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, he looked up, it says, he, said, he looked up into heaven. And he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. So Stephen didn't look and say, oh, I see Jesus. No, he looked up, he saw God, and he saw Jesus standing next to God. The words are clear. Jesus was standing on the right hand of God. If Jesus is God himself, how can he stand at the right hand of himself? The next verse, and behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right 
hand of God. Again, he reiterates that. He's standing on the right hand of God. Thank you.